Great, great. Now, Lee, before you leave, I have something for you. Make sure we get it. <clears throat> I forgot it. I left it over at the house. So I, that's why I'm saying it now, so we don't forget it. Well, a couple weeks ago, uh, Brandon and I had to call uh, a man into our office because we really needed to straighten him out. And while he was with us, we had a great time talking about the Lord, and he shared his testimony with us, and I said, you got you to gotta share uh, the testimony in church on Father's Day. And Brandon said, I was thinking exactly the same thing. And uh, uh, Brother Mark Reed from uh, Berkeley Springs, now don't hold that against them. Now, I know it says, they say almost heaven. Well, <clears throat> my, I'd have to say my father-in-law is almost heaven. <laughs> For you, yeah. But I don't hope you're almost heaven yet. I hope you have a lot of years. But we're going to ask Mark to come on up, if you will, please, brother. And uh, Mark is going to share at least uh, an outline and a specific part of his testimony, and uh, we hope that you'll listen to him and pay attention, and uh, we believe that what he has to say is very important to all of us, but specifically to all the fathers who are here. Now, Mark, how am I going to get this set up so that we can hear you? Can you stand near the microphone or, or what? Yeah, that's fine. But it's scary up here. No, it's not. I, was, <laughs> I, I can hang around, and if you, you know, need me, just call. Now, he asked me about doing the testimony. And he said doing the portion that we were talking about. And I said, well, what's wrong with the whole testimony? <laughs> so he paused. And he looks at me and he says, well, Mark, i got to get up there and preach yet. They'll be asleep by the time I get up there. <laughs> so I threw that testimony out the window. <laughs> and I made well, one up. you can at least tell them when you got saved. Tell them when you came to the Lord. Yes. That's yeah. What I'm going to do. Amen. Okay. okay. Yeah. Hey, what a privilege it is to uh, be a child of God. Um, Amen. And if you're not a child of God... Today's an awesome day on Father's Day to come down, give your heart to God. Yes. Today's the day of salvation. So, uh, one, I'd like to say happy Father's Day to all you dads. And uh, it's been a long time since I've been up in front of a congregation. So bear with me if you would, please. Um, and in my message, well, my testimony, if I'm not out to offend anybody, step on anybody's toes, I'm just speaking truth. Um, and if you have an issue with that, you can see Pastor Doug and Brandon <laughs> when we're done. See Pastor Brandon. <laughs> yeah. Now, I am on a short time limit, uh, and if I get sidetracked, then he, he's going to use his taser on me. <laughs> so um, bear with me. And it's no lie about the West Virginia slang. We have our own slang. My wife, Karen, she said, you can't get up there and say yuns. It's not a word. I said, well, I use it all the time. I have yeah, own, we say yuns. I have my own vocabulary. So um, let's see. My wife and I, we started to have... Uh, her family, our three girls, I'm blessed to have them with us today, Natalie, Vanessa, and Rachel. It's already starting. So, uh, and what a privilege it is to be a dad. Yes, amen. Um, so, I was just the average guy, you know. I liked, uh, I liked my beer. I was a smoker. And uh, the girls were small, 
We weren't church people. Hmm. Tell you the truth, I didn't know the first thing about being a Christian. Um, hmm. My definition would have been a person who goes to church. Hmm. Well, uh, Karen felt led to want to start our family going to church. Praise God for that. So we started going to church and everything seemed okay. Uh, the girls were happy for the most part, um, which they were small. I knew my wife was enjoying going. Well, I was struggling and God works in mysterious ways. So mm -hmm. I didn't know this at the time, but I, I do now how uh, the, the Lord, <laughs> he was working. He was stirring me up. I didn't know for what or whatever. I just knew that I was off balance. Um, I enjoyed going to church. It made my family happy. So I was happy. I was happy for that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. We, we were into it a few few weeks into like a month and a half and I was struggling. It's like I didn't know the Lord but I would talk out and I would say, you know, I don't feel nothing, Lord. Here I am getting cleaned up on a Sunday, going to church. I'm feeling the part. Uh, everything looked fine, but I was empty. And boy, was I empty. Um, I'm sorry, it's just, it's emotional. Uh, they had VBS coming up, and they asked my wife if she would participate and help out, and she said yes. Well, when that week approached, it was like middle of the week, she said, "Hun, will not you... Um, come up and get to know some of the guys. It's more kick back, relax atmosphere. It's like, I go to church on Sunday, now you want me to go through the week? <laughs> um, and she said, well, you, you know, like I said, it give you a good chance to get to know some of the fellas. It's like, well, tell them where we live and then come meet me. I just, it's like, ah. Oh. So, um, at this point in my life, I was uh, worked for, well, I was a route tech um, for a communication company. And I would troubleshoot. So wherever the problem was, they would send me. And you stayed on the job till you finished. Um, unless the big shots came in and uh, told you otherwise. So that day, uh, I was down on the other side of Gaithersburg or Bethesda or something. That was my territory. And I went, I worked in IBM, NIH. Uh, we had equipment in there. And I, that day, I was just miserable. And the people around me, you worked on your own, but you had a point of contact uh, every site. And they just knew Mark was not his same person. So uh, I just knew I had it in my head, you know, I got to go to church tonight. And that just, I mean, I'm telling you, the wheels were turning. It felt like I was definitely going against the grain. So uh, I think Karen called me earlier and said about coming up and all. I said, yeah, it's time. <coughs> so I thought, man, it'd be an awesome opportunity to say I'm stuck on this job and I'm not going to be able to make it. And I kept feeling that knock on my heart. God tell me, boy, you got to get to church that night. You need to go. 
And it was like, wow, man, you know, I felt this pressure out of nowhere. Um, and like I said, I had no relationship with Christ. I knew of him. I didn't know him. Um, so, and I can tell you, uh, I'm going to interrupt and stop for a minute because the church Karen and I used to attend on Mother's Day, they would pat the moms on the back, commend them, build them up for being the mothers that they are. But on Father's Day, we got beat down, thrown to the curve. Amen. Yeah. They need it. So I will say today, we're not going to change anything. So, but no, I am here to uh, try to build the men up. Um, might just come out different. So I started heading up the road that day, closed all my tickets, kept looking at my watch. And I thought, man, I'm going to get home enough time where I'm going to feel obligated to go up there. And like I said, I felt uh, led to go. And it's like that knock. So I went home, freshened up, um, went ahead and uh, Got cleaned up a little bit. Now that's dangerous that. right there. <laughs> Put that back on your arm. I don't want taste. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so what happened? I'm already running behind. No, yeah, get up there and tell. So stand up so they can hear you. Uh, okay. So I went up to church, and everybody was doing their thing. And we're getting hungry. Oh my goodness. You want me to cut it short now? <laughs> not. Wow. You're not lying when you said a small portion. So uh, I just felt drawn to this wall out front there. Oh, uh, what's that called, Karen? No. The four year area? No, but you had another name for it. I, yeah. Um, being West Virginia, I'd just call it a uh, vegetable, but it was the vestibule. Vestibule, right. <laughs> so uh, I kept looking over the side, and here was this object over on the wall. Well, I walked over, and here I looked, and it was like an open faced bookshelf with these individual slots. Well, in these slots was gospel tracts. And I kept looking, and I found this one. It just stuck out like, bam. Mm -hmm. It was yellow. And I have it today. I carry it with me. It's the four spiritual laws. And I'm telling you, mm -hmm. if you never read it, you need to. Mm -hmm. Okay? Amen. Um, well, I, I was looking at it. Now, remember, I was... Uh, I left out where I was coming up the road, had the tunes playing, shut them off, and it's like, man, Lord, you're going to, if you're real, you need to uh, uh, show me. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to reveal yourself to me in some way, because right now, I'm going through the motion, I'm doing all the right things, my family's in church, uh, I kind of like it, you know, and the men, they seem okay. I didn't know him, know him a whole lot yet, um, but I didn't know if that was my, if it, that was the definition of being a Christian. And like I said, I just feel empty inside. Everything looked good on the outside, but on the inside, I was empty. So it's like, Lord, I don't want to feel like this. I come to church, I want more. I, I want the real deal. Um, I don't want to go church and just play the part and mm -hmm. be a part-time Christian. Amen. Um, so mm -hmm. I know <laughs> uh, what happened next was an answered prayer. So I looked at this four spiritual laws. I got it out of the slot and I was reading it. I'm telling you, out of nowhere, this voice behind me said, do you know anything about the Holy Spirit? 
and I just like froze. It's like, uh, no. He said, do you want to? I knew, I knew that was the Lord speaking through this person. And he answered my call. God knew I was serious. He knew I was sincere. And if you seek God and you're sincere, you will find him. Amen. Believe me. Yes. So I turned around and I looked at this man, this older gentleman, and I'm telling you, he had a glow like an angel. It just melted me. Um, this gentleman asked me if I would be, he said, uh, you're a fairly new person. And I said, yes. And he said, uh, I don't want to see you through the week. I know you go down the road, he said, but I'd like for you to come out my house. He said, can you come out on Friday nights? And I said, yes. So I said something to Karen after that. I went out to that man's house every Friday night for a year. One hour turned into an hour and a half, turned into two hours. It would be nothing to be three hours, four hours. I was so hungry that he said I was like a sponge. I just kept absorbing it. He couldn't feed me fast enough the word of God. I'm telling you, I never realized God loved me so much. Hey, amen. And, and I thought, wow, where's this guy been my whole life? Hmm. But I wasn't looking for him. Hmm. And that's what I tell everyone, but mostly you men. If you're just playing the part, <clears throat> you're wasting your time, okay? Don't turn this place into a social hall. Come in here, and how privileged we are to come in here and hear Pastor Doug, Pastor Brandon, preach the truth week in and week out. And I listened to the one lady that sings, and you know, her little testimony sometimes, she said about how blessed we are, but would we still be here singing if there was no cushions on the pews or anything like that? And I thought, you can get so set in your ways and you focus on everything else that you miss God's blessing and what a privilege it is. Because there's people like Kathy, she goes out and she sees these little huts and what they what it takes to make them happy. And I look at us sometimes and I feel like, man, you feel bad. But the worst would be to stand before God and he say, depart from me, I never knew you. Mm -hmm. To know that you go in a church, air conditioned, heat in the winter, uh, good fellowship, and it doesn't mean anything to you. And you come in like a, like, like a, a, a mannequin. And you go out that way. And I'm telling you, don't take that for granted. Mm. You don't know when your last breath, your last heartbeat is going to be. Mm. And I would hate to go out here and get involved in an accident and take your life. And you had all the opportunity to surrender to Christ yes and you chose not to mm. and I think I mentioned it to Doug and Brandon that uh, for me I'm just I gotta have it all or I don't want none mm. um, you, you have to be in the word every day you have to be on your knees you have to uh, spend time with God every day. You can't just come to church on a Sunday and hear a message and go back out and your life turns. You, you know, we, we need Christ every day, not yes. just some of the time, not just a couple hours on Sunday. It's not going to work. This world will chew you up and spit you out. Yeah. Okay? It's a spiritual war out there. And you need to know the arsenal that God has given us as children of God. You need to know how to fight the darkness and the devil. Um, so I'm just saying, 
to everyone, but mostly young men, you have kids and everything, uh, they need you to be that spiritual warrior. They need that yes. spiritual dad in the house. Yes. And if you're struggling with these little baby steps, you need to find somebody to hook up with like I did. Get a mentor in your life. Have good fellowship, okay? And sometimes it's nice to be out there doing things, but it does not hurt to be just sitting there at a table one-on-one -on -one with someone that's going to feed you the truth, but you got to want it. Okay, you can talk to your blue in the face, and if you don't want it, you're wasting your time. So, uh, it wasn't long after that, Karen and I, we got saved, praise God, through the grace of God. Uh, well, God started working on me already, started to convict me. Like I said, I'd have a beer or two, and I smoked, and I, I wasn't proud of it, but that's who I was. Well... This is going to be tough to share this. Um, one day out in the yard, uh, my daughter and I, the middle one, Vanessa, we were walking around the yard holding hands, and she stopped, and I looked down at her, and she said, well, I said, sweetie, what's wrong? And she said, Daddy, your hand stinks. And I said, what? She said, your hand stinks. And I smoked my hand, and... It's like it just reeked with nicotine. I mean, just reeked. And I felt like a hill that my kids had to smell that just for me to support my stupid habit. And then she looked at me with that little face and she said, Daddy, I wish you didn't smoke. It's not good for you. And I thought to myself, how can I love this nasty, sinful habit more than I love my daughter? And I said, it's time for me to grow up. It's time for me to shed this darkness and this bad habit. And I'm a new man now, I've become a Christian. Well, I need to start living it and acting like it. So, uh, it was no problem. Very shortly after that, I was able to give them up. And it's been 20 years or so. Never desired the, the taste or desire to smoke. Haven't drank a bit of alcohol for over 20 years, smoked a cigarette or anything, through the grace of God. Amen. Now, Amen. I got one little closure here. Oh, one, one yeah, closure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so... Now, now that, that is bad. Is it? Yeah. I mean, it's bad enough when they go like this and look. It's worse when they go. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm playing Biden. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. oh. Sorry if I offended oh. anybody. <laughs> so, uh, we went back to church. Uh, church was going on for a few weeks. Um, well, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they talked about, the pastor mentioned, hey, we're going to get a group to go to Promise Keepers. Mm -hmm. And I thought, man, I heard a lot about that. It'd be good, me being a new mm -hmm. Christian, a babe in Christ, uh, couldn't wait to be around the men, love God, and want to go down there and, man, just enjoy it. Well, we met up there at the church on a Friday around lunch because they, they were having a uh, Friday uh, event down there. I think it was down in Baltimore. And they were having one Saturday night. So we, we had load up on Friday. Everybody got in the van. There was like 15 of us. We no more left there and we got down to Big Pool where Exxon is. Well, we got down there to uh, pull in to fill up. Well, here the doors opened up, side doors, and everybody piled out. Half the men in there went over to the curb and fired up cigarettes. And I said, you gotta be kidding me. You know, I mean, I'm going down, wanting to uh, fellowship with these men, I'm looking for them to lean on and help me grow strong as a Christian. And 
the guy was uh, spiritually mentoring me told me, he said, you're going to realize that you need to follow Jesus and not man. Amen. So I looked in them guys, and, and I'm telling you, I was disappointed. I was just heartbroken. Mm -hmm. And I feel bad, and I, and I knew that some of these men had been going to church for a while. And I struggled with not knowing why they couldn't get rid of this habit. Now, I'm not here telling you a beer is going to kill you or a cigarette. You do your thing. That's between you and God. But I'm just telling you, if you're doing something that's tarnishing your testimony, you are becoming a stumbling block. Mm -hmm. And so I thought to myself, I remembered what my mentor told me and then I remembered I was starting to remember scripture at this time and I thought first John 4 4 he who is in me is greater than he is in the world amen and I'm telling you I got back in that van and I thought I feel sorry for you guys mm -hmm. I feel sorry for you that you are not ready to you want to stay a babe in Christ and drink the milk you don't want to grow up and eat solid food. Mm. And I thought, shame on you, but I feel sorry for your family. Yes. Because your family's counting on you to be that spiritual leader and that man. And you're sitting there um, more worried about your habit than you are your family. And I'm sorry if that comes across harsh in any way, but I'm just telling you the truth. And if you think that this is hard, you don't, we don't want to stand before God mm. and mm. realize that he gave us all the opportunities in our life to do the right thing. Mm. And he puts people in your life, mm. okay? He appoints certain people at a certain time for a reason. And if you don't start grasping and pulling positive energy, like coming up here and hearing... Uh, Brandon and, and Pastor Doug and it's just words intellectually in one ear and out the other you need to seek some good fellowship and don't be ashamed because I was nothing I didn't even know what a Christian was and I'm telling you you need accountability if you don't have accountability then you're going to notice that your integrity starts dwindling mm. so amen that's it that's praise it. the lord uh, thank you brother thank you amen if you have your bibles i'd like you to turn to first samuel and uh i will do my best to get through this as quickly as he got through his testimony first samuel chapter one 1 Samuel chapter 1. This is a turning point in the history of Israel. Uh, if you know anything about Bible history, you know that first, God led his people by a group of men that we call patriarchs, which basically means father. There were fathers that led the nation. And of course, uh, you know, the first great men are men like Abraham and men like Moses and God raised up Joshua and others and there were patriarchs that led the nation. After that period of time, we moved into a period of time known as Judges. There wasn't a patriarch any longer. The nation had grown in number, and the leadership had gotten divided, and God had raised up individuals that were known as judges. And these judges would lead the nation. And there were basically two groups. There were the priests and the judges. And uh, uh, the, the judges were uh, not doing so well. In fact, if you go to the very last chapter of the book of Judges, it tells us that in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And we're living like that today. Men are just choosing to do what they want to do rather than listening to, to spiritual leadership and they're not being led in the way they should go. And Israel had fallen into idolatry like it did so often throughout his history. And 
there was a, a priest. His name was uh, uh, Eli, and Eli was the head guy. And he had two boys, Hophni and Phinehas, and they were his sons, and the Bible paints a picture of them that they were not very good at all. And the nation was suffering. And God decided to raise up another leader. That leader becomes Samuel. Samuel becomes a prophet and a priest, and Samuel becomes the one that anoints the first king of Israel, and that's David, of course. And so this transition happens. And the point that, that I want to emphasize today is the necessity of raising up new leaders from the generation that today we would call the youth or the young people in the nation. God wants to raise up leadership out of that generation. And we critically need to follow God's design that that can happen. It ought to be the burden on our heart. God, yeah, you know, one of the most amazing passages in John 17, Jesus is praying what is known as the high priestly prayer. And uh, he's getting ready to be crucified the next day, and he's preparing his disciples, and he prays in this prayer an amazing fact. He said, I pray not just for these guys, but I'm praying for those who will believe in you, believe in God through their word, that God literally believed, that, that Jesus believed that the next generation would become as godly as the generation that Jesus was leading. He believed that. God's committed to that. God is committed to a church that will stand and pass the test of time and be here until Jesus comes. That's what God wants to happen. And you and I are called to that as families to guarantee that there will be a godly generation that comes up after us. I think of Camp Joyelle. Many of you have been over there or you've heard of the release time ministry and Camp Joyelle. They, they have a, a purpose and a mission statement that says that they are raising up a generation of Jacob who will seek God, that that's what they're committed to, that they want to raise up the next generation that they will set their heart on the Lord and that they will live for Him all their days. And this passage that we're looking at in uh, 1 Samuel is a passage that teaches us some principles about how we can do that. How can we raise up the next generation? How can God move by His Spirit in order to raise up the next leaders that are going to continue the work of God after many of us are gone and we're in heaven? Who's going to rise up? Who's going to stand in the gap? Who's going to fill that position? Who is going to lead the people of of God and teach them the Word of God. It's the individuals that we raise up out of our households and our families to serve the Lord. And that's what 1 Samuel is all about. And particularly the first three chapters. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn there to chapter 1 and verse 8. Chapter 1 and verse 8. Then Elkanah her husband said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? And am I not better to you than ten sons? Now, uh, the story is that Elkanah had two wives. And the one wife had children, but Hannah did not have any children. And, and the, the wife that had children always was taunting Hannah. She kind of rubbed it in her face that, well, <laughs> you know, you don't have any children. I have children. Obviously, I'm the 
favored wife, the blessed wife, and so Hannah became heavy in her heart that she had no children. And Elkanah, by the way, if I can teach anything today, that will stick with you. I want you to get this. I, I want you to understand the question that Elkanah had asked his wife Hannah. Am I not more valuable to you than ten sons? Now, here's the obviously uh, implied answer. The answer is yes. Now, I want you to know that I, we should love our children. We should love our grandchildren. We should do everything in our power to take care of them. But understand this that the foundation of a godly home is a godly marriage. That, that the relationship of husband and wife is the most critical and most foundational relationship in all of society. If marriages fail, if they are not fulfilling in our life, if we are not living in contentment and peace with our spouse, our children will not be able to grow up and become everything that God wants them to become. There needs to be a commitment between husbands and wives in love and commitment and peace and contentment in that relationship. Elkanah said, hey Hannah, I love you. I want you to love me. Don't worship your children. Don't put them before your marriage. I I understand that, that especially mothers, you, you have a natural inbred desire to, to take care of your brood. You want to do that. But I want to tell you this. The most important person as a wife in your life is your husband, not your children. I, I tell people that, you know, come in and get premarital counseling, and I say, well, <laughs> you know, think about this. Do you really, do you really want to spend the rest of your life with this goofball right over here? I said, do you understand? I know that sometimes you think, well, we have children, and we'll stay together for children's sake, and, and it's so important that we do that. And, and so you get committed to that. And I, I remind them of this. Your children, at, at most, will spend 20 years with you. You spend 20 years with your, fa your mother and father, your family, and then, as the Bible says, for this cause shall a, a man and a woman leave their father and mother and be joined to their spouse, and they will cling to one another. And listen, <laughs> if you live a normal life, you're going to spend not 20 but you're going to spend 30, 40, perhaps 50, 65 years with the individual that you marry and, and your relationship with your spouse is the most fundamental foundational relationship you have on this earth. Your marriage must be the most important thing. Amen. Now, uh, love your children, take care of them, train them, provide for them, but the reality is <laughs> you need to love each other and be contented in each other and share your spiritual life together as a husband and wife more than any other relationship you have on the earth. And, and man, hasn't the devil in the world torn that to pieces? I mean, there's never been a time in the history of the world that I'm aware of when so many people are shacked up. I mean, there are people moving in together, living with each other, even having children, and they've never gotten married, never making the commitment to God 
to be the husband and wife that they're supposed to be. And that, my friend, is wrong, and it will never build the kind of families that God wants us to have. Because the first thing was Adam and Eve. Not the children. They came later. Adam and Eve. And the number one responsibility that we have as a married individual is to our spouse. Amen. Preach your brother. Preach it. I'm going to tell you the truth. I think there are people sitting in here right now that don't believe that. I think there are people in here that don't see life that way at all. That the spouse is that, not that meaningful. to. Do you understand there's no other relationship where the Bible teaches that two become one flesh. Parent and child don't become one flesh. Even if you've born them in your womb and they've come forth from your womb and your body, you do not become one with your children. But you do become one with your spouse. That's what the Bible teaches. And the most fundamental, most important relationship that any of us have who are married is with our spouse. I'm not going to be able to get through this message. I'm going to cover all three chapters. And <laughs> I haven't gotten past the first statement of Elkanah. Hannah, don't you know that I love you? Hannah, am I not worth more than ten... So <laughs> Here's the shame of it. Some... Some of you parents don't even make your spouse for more, feel more important than one son or one daughter. Shame on you. You have bought into a lie. You have not learned the truth of God. The, the reason why we have so many failures is because we have failing marriages. And, and we don't get them right. If you don't get them right, then the rest of the story doesn't work. And the rest of what God does in raising up Samuel, and he does raise him up miraculously, but it starts with the first question. Hannah, don't you know I love you? Hannah, don't you love me? You're important to me, why am I not important to you? Why are you weeping over children when you have me? <laughs> now, I, I know that might sound odd to some of you. You just can't imagine seeing, you know, your spouse or your husband walking through the door and thinking, wow, look what I got. Well, I can tell you this. My dear mother... I, I don't know how many times I heard this. I, what did she live? Ten years after Dad passed? Something like that. And now she enjoyed when we would come and visit. But in phone calls, my mother got very lonely. <laughs> you know, when you're 94 years old and, and you still live on your own and you're in the house that you've lived in for nearly 70 years of your life with the man of your dreams. And now mom would want us to visit, but I never heard her say, oh, I look at the door and sometimes just think to myself, oh, I wish Doug would walk in. Oh, I wish Keith would walk in. I wish Kent would walk in. Never. But you know what she did say? Boy... I look at that door and think to myself, I just wish Bob would walk through that door again one more time. Am I not more valuable? Isn't our marriage more important than anything? I don't know why God's got me stuck on this thing. 
other than the fact that maybe some of you need to learn this in your life, especially those of you who are just starting out and about to start your family, who you find out that God wants you to marry is critically important. It, it can make the difference <laughs> even in the success of your walk with Christ. It will impact your relationship with God more than any other relationship you have on the earth, your relationship with your spouse. Again, I, I, I understand what Mark is saying. We're not here to beat anybody up. We're, we're not here to jump up and down on you with both feet and pulverize you and drive you into ground. But what we are here to do is try to rescue you. Brandon can tell you already in these few short months that, you know, he's come on board. He can tell you what it's like, the relentless return of broken people. And how many of those broken people come, and it's because of broken family and broken marriages. Oh, my golly. Sometimes I hate the devil. I just hate the devil. If I had him here, I'd put him in a box, and I'd lock the box, and I'd throw away the keys. Hannah, am I not more valuable to you? I will tell you this. From the story of Elkanah and Hannah, what you find out is that they were on the same spiritual wavelength. I mean, when she prayed this crazy prayer, Lord, give me a child, give me a son, and I will give him back to you so that he can live all of his days for you. And do you know, Elkanah agreed. In fact, when they talked about when are you going to take him and give him to the priest, when are you going to take him to Eli, when's he going to be there? And she said, well, I'd like to wean him. And, and Elkanah said, absolutely, let's keep him until you wean him, and then we'll turn him over so that the word of the Lord might be settled and that it might be established. We want God's truth to be established. Uh, man, praise the Lord. A husband a wife would actually pray together about major decisions and what you're going to do with your children? Wow! Imagine that! Instead of just assuming, what if husbands and wives actually prayed together? What if they understood God's plan for them as a family? And the husband and the wife agreed together on it and said, let's do this thing as one. Woo! Do you know what the world has done? I, I'm going to tell you this story, and, and I have to lay this aside. I, I certainly want to preach this sermon sometime. What a great outline I have. Tremendous. Tremendous sermon. 1969, early, well, late in that year, beginning of my sophomore year in college, and we go to Greenwich Village, New York City, and, of course, we visited the United Nations, and, and uh, we're, it's part of our ethics class, and we're, we're, our minds are being expanded, and we're learning, and <clears throat> we go down there in the middle of Greenwich Village. There's a place called Washington Square. It's where back in those days we called them beatniks and, you know, whatever. They, we didn't call them hayseeds or we, we didn't call them granolas or whatever you want to call them today. But they were the beatniks. 
And we actually gathered in the parsonage of a church. And we sat with two, a, a pastor, and I'm beginning, as time has gone on, I believe maybe they were partners, men. And here's, here's what those men told us. Well, we believe the day is coming when we no longer will leave the raising of children to unprepared, untrained, uneducated biological parents. We will have trained individuals who will be able to lead our children better than we can because we've done studies, psychologists and sociologists, and we've discovered, for instance, that you can take a duckling and you can get it to follow any duck. And because most individuals are so ill-equipped and untrained and uneducated, we, we need to train special child Razors. This is back in this is back before 1970. Guess what the culture has thrust upon us? Do you know how many administrators and school counselors and teachers have told their students, well, your parents aren't always right. Don't listen to your parents. The other day, some of my grandchildren asked me this question. Hey, Pappy, which do you like best? Andy Griffith, Andy and Mayberry, or Father Knows Best? Which do you like best? I said, well, honestly, I mean, I like them both, but I'm going to have to pick Father Knows Best. How... Many of you know my favorite movie of all times, right? <laughs> it's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart and, you know, Clarence the Angel. It, it's not biblically or theologically correct. But there are some truths in that movie that stand out to me. And one is when, when you know, young George Bailey worked in the drugstore for Mr. Gower. And Mr. Gower was, well, he was intoxicated. He was a pharmacist. That was back when you didn't just count pills. That's when pharmacists took, you know, the, the bowl and the pedestal, and, and they would grind up compounds, and they would actually mix them chemically and make drugs and treatments and all of that. And young George Bailey had watched Mr. Gower behind the counter with cigar hanging in his mouth and tears in his eyes. And he had, he had a jar that he put back up and George could read it and knew that it was poisoned. And he didn't know what to do. What do I do? He tried to talk to Mr. Gower. Mr. Gower slapped him on the ear, remember? George had the bad ear all his life ever since that. And he walked down in the front part of the store, and up on the wall was one of those tin signs. Ask Father. He knows best. Do you have any idea how powerful a statement that is? Ask Father. He knows best. And the world has tried to picture us as a bunch of buffoons. Ignorant, unlearned. Can I tell you something? If you know Jesus, and you have this, you're never a fool, and you're no buffoon.
and the world is successfully tearing marriage and families to pieces and propagating lies against the very design of God. In the beginning, Jesus said, have you not read? <laughs> Is Jesus the Son of God? Have you not read? He meant this. Have you not read that at the beginning God created them, male and female? And we all know he made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And the very fabric that which has been woven together since the beginning of time by God it's becoming unraveled and torn apart by the lies of the enemy. I want to tell you that if you're here today, I, I believe in you. If you are married, then that's your appointed place. That's your appointed assignment. That's the single most important thing you can get committed to. I mean, if you end up living in a tent, it really, ultimately, bottom line, doesn't matter. How many people live in mansions? And if that which God intended to weave together has been torn apart, what good is it? What, what does it mean? It's nothing. All of that from Alcana's question, <laughs> am I not more valuable to you than ten sons? And too, too many people can't answer that in the affirmative, but should. Should. Do your kids a favor and love your wife. Love your husband. Be committed to one another. Do you know what the Word of God says? Here's the promise over there in Psalm 127, 128, where God's talking to the man, lest the Lord builds a house, those who labor, labor in vain. Lest the Lord keeps the city, the man stays up all night, watches, is watching in vain. In 128, he goes on and says, and, and your wife will be like a fruitful vine, <laughs> and you'll sit at your table, and everybody will sit around the table. And then he says this, that man will set in the gate. Now you have to understand, the gate was the place of influence. That's where the elders sat. That's where the wise men of the city sat, at the gate. That's where everybody looked for answers, at the gate. And the man who has his house in order... I, I'm telling you, I've been studying for three weeks this passage, 1 Samuel chapter 1, 2, and 3. There is so much stuff in there. In, in 1 Samuel. What was Eli's problem? 
If I had my hat on, I'd be telling you, I'm throwing it on the floor. Two, two boys, two boys that turned ministry into a hated, it says the whole society hated church. They hated bringing offerings to church. They hated anything that had to do with God because of two boys who were stealing money for themselves and, get a load of this, laying with women who came to the temple to make offerings and they were having ungodly sexual immorality. And Eli even asked them, why do you do it? tells us very clearly. I've underlined it, highlighted it. I put little asterisks around it. It says, because Eli restrained them not. Eli restrained them not. There, there's, one of my, there's one of our favorite expressions that I, I mean, I use it in a negative way. You, you know, now I don't know how many of you get eggs from free-range chickens. But I suppose we get some from free-range chickens. And that's supposed to be the best. Free-range chickens. I guess it is. I don't know. Some of you tried it. And then you have problems with, you know, animals at night, skunks and weasels and stuff like that, and hawks fly around and take your chickens, you know. And some of them don't come back in. And there has become a philosophy of raising children. We call them free-range kids. The most wicked, ungodly method of raising children is free-range kids. It is ungodly, unbiblical, not so. I don't care what Dr. Spock said and started. You don't want to cramp their style. You don't want to break their spirit. Well, they need something broken. According to the Bible, it's the sin nature that's in them. It's the foolishness in their heart that only the rod of discipline will drive away. If you don't use the rod of discipline and you do not restrain your children, they will run amok. And then you do this. Help me, Jesus. I've got to stop this. Well, you know, we all have to go a little wild during our teenage years. No, you don't! How absolutely ludicrous and asinine that we would believe that we are raising children, taking them to Sunday school and church, just so that when they become a teenager, they can sow a few wild oats. You find that in 1 Samuel 1 through 3. The only people that sowed wild oats was Hophni and Phinehas. <laughs> But Samuel never did because the commitment was you're going to spend all, he's going to spend all his days for God. He's going to live all his days before you, Lord. And the notion, <sighs> you see, discipline drives foolishness from the heart of the child. And you do it out of loving compassion because you want to save them from addictions and brokenness and wrong choices. Okay. If I could say anything else to you, it would be this. Love your households and your families enough to make God the center. Learn to pray for each other, not just in church, but at home. Learn to follow the pattern God's put in His Word. Why? Because we're one generation away from the church totally tanking. And the only prevention is a strong home 
Not a strong Sunday school. I love Sunday school. Not a strong VBS. And Heather's been working already and getting excited about VBS. My wife's working already, making posters. She's already meeting with some of her people about Awana. We love kids. We want to train kids. But if we do that as a church and the home doesn't back it up or support it, it's like throwing stuff to the wind. And if I could say, make God the center of your home and your marriage and build it on a rock. And do everything in your power to get everybody in your household into the fold, <laughs> into the family of God. You will have done a lot. In fact, to me, you will have been a success. <laughs> you can fail at everything else. I mean, you can even drive a Chevy. You can drive a John Deere. <laughs> but it, 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 if you rescue your home, and you and your spouse walk with Jesus, and you get your children right with God, so that they're listening to his voice and walking with him. You're a success. And nothing else matters. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you are indeed a good, good Father. You are the best. And we know Father knows best. And our hearts are heavy and, and burdened for the lives of children and youth. Well, not just them, but I think of grown-ups that I know. Husbands and wives that are unhappy and miserable, unfulfilled. Lord, I pray that by your Spirit that you will move in the heart and life of every person here. Pray for those who are already married. Lord, I pray draw them closer to each other as husbands and wives. And then, Lord, especially for our children, we want to pray that as we commit them to you, that you'll keep them. That the enemy, that the devil will not be able to get his claws stuck in them. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ over the lives of all of our children. Lord, protect them, especially from the ungodly lies in the darkness that surrounds them in this world. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, draw them into your kingdom that they might live in it now and forever in the ages to come. Bless not only the Word, but I pray you'll bless the fellowship that families will share around the table. Thank you for those who have worked to prepare the food. We pray, Father, as we go over to the Family Life Center, I pray that each of us will receive your supply with thanksgiving and gratitude, that it will be sanctified to our use, that it will nourish us, physically strengthen us, and Lord, that we will use that strength
to serve you, to praise you, to lift up your holy name. And we'll give you the glory and the honor and the praise forever and ever. And all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Go through those double doors, and we're going to go over, I presume.